according to the police officer I spoke to. They went through a list of questions in order to ascertain whether or not she was safe and determined that she was okay to be on her own on the streets of Victoria, barefoot in November, and they left her there. That was the last time anyone ever saw her. You are listening to Emma Filipoff is Missing, a series by the Nighttime Podcast. Welcome to the sixth in an eight-part series covering the still unexplained disappearance of Emma Filipoff. Then 26-year-old Emma was last seen standing barefoot and disoriented on a busy intersection in downtown Victoria, BC on November 28, 2012. Despite significant public interest, there has not been another confirmed sighting of Emma. With the handful of clues Emma left behind leading to more questions than they do answers, my coverage of this story aims to better understand Emma and hopefully, in doing so, better understanding Emma's behavior during her last known days and the factors that may have played a hand in her disappearance. With that as our goal, we'll continue to meet with those close to Emma, following my best take on a chronological order. But before we jump into it, let me give a bit of context and fill in a few blanks in the timeline. In the prior episode, we spoke with Emma's friend Michaela, who had shared her memories of living with Emma just as she arrived in Victoria in late 2011. As we heard Michaela describe, after a few months of living together, Emma moved out in favor of her own apartment in the same building. And from there, Michaela had limited contact with Emma and was focused on her education. We don't know why exactly, but we do know that at some point, not long after Emma moved into her own apartment, she left it and began staying at the Sandy Merriman Women's Shelter. It's during this time of transition that we'll pick up the story. But before we jump into it, I first need to tackle a confusing coincidence, as it turns out tonight's guest has the same name as our past guest, Michaela. However, conveniently, tonight's guest goes by the abbreviated version, Micah, and does so for an interesting reason. You don't go by Michaela, you just go by Micah? Yeah, bit of a thing. Um, it actually has to do with Emma, weirdly enough. <laughs> How does that have to do with Emma? She sometimes called me that. And then it just stuck? Yeah, it was something that I was just like, I will go by this until she's found kind of thing. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, when I began the series of interviews, Micah's was one I was especially looking forward to. During Emma's time in Victoria, she had only two stable homes. The first was the one she shared with Michaela, and the second, which turned out to be her last, was the one Micah will describe shortly. I'm going to warn you in advance. The version of Emma we will hear described tonight is very different than the Emma Ellen and Michaela knew. So with the warning and the introductions out of the way, let's get to the conversation. Tonight, in this episode of the nighttime series Emma Filipoff is Missing, we're going to hear from Micah. So, Micah, c- can you tell me how, how you first met Emma, and, and when was it that, that you you've first crossed paths with her? Um, when I first crossed paths with her, it would have been about... November or like late November or December of 2011 a friend of mine was busking and she was just hanging out there and so I went to say hi to my friend and we had friendly greetings and Emma didn't really say much but when I introduced myself she was like oh my I my best like childhood friend is named Michaela like what a coincidence I was like that's weird because of my best childhood friend or one of my best childhood friends is named Emma and we like kind of giggled about that and then our friend started playing music and busking more and I I had my sketchbook with me and I drew a picture of her that was my first encounter with her very cool and it it was I guess about four months after that that you ended up moving in together. When was that that you moved in together? That would have been February two thousand and twelve, late February two thousand and twelve. What led to you moving in together? How did that start? Well, um, I had a roommate who moved out. There was another person who 
was recommended to me who was looking for a place and I introduced her to the landlord. She saw the house and she loved it. And um, I introduced her to the landlord and the landlord thought she was fine. And she had been staying at the women's shelter. And I just instantly kind of jumped to the conclusion of, oh, well, you know, some people have to do what they got to do to while they can't find a place. And housing in Victoria is ridiculous anyway, that like, whatever. And then after she was there for a short, like a few days, and she asked if her friend from the women's shelter could come and stay with us. And then it eventually evolved that that girl left and Emma stayed. Because <laughs> that girl that she invited was Emma. Great. So the way it ended up working out is you had someone you knew from the women's shelter. They moved in with you. Then they brought their friend along who was who was Emma, who you had met, you know, a couple months prior. When she um, when she was like, oh, yeah, like I, I have my friend Emma. She's like really lovely. You'll really like her. And, and I was like, does she have really long braids? And like, does she look like this and this? And I and I and then she was like, yeah, she does. And I showed her the picture that I drew. And I was just like, oh, whatever. Like, that that's crazy. Like, what a serendipity. Yeah, I like, totally. <laughs> That's, um, that's very cool. But you didn't have a relationship with Emma. You, you ran into her that no. one time and next thing you know, yeah. she's moving in. Yeah, yeah exactly. And just to put it in perspective, like you, when she was living with you, how, how much older is, is Emma than, than you are? She, I was 19 at the time, 18, and then I turned 19. And she would have been 26. Okay. She would have just turned 26 because her birthday is in January. <laughs> Prior to, to Emma living with you, what did you know about her life? Like you, you knew she had been with staying with the shelter uh, at the shelter with with your, you know, the roommate that brought Emma along with her. Like, what did you know about her life prior to living with you? And what details like about her life did she share with you? She was very reserved about it. And she didn't seem like she wanted to share a lot and i didn't pry and that was i think how she we became as close as we did is because of i never pushed her into any sort of information um she told me about her about her family here and there but it was never like a direct kind of answer she was quite cryptic with and poetic with a lot of her things which just made me feel like okay like this like she just needs her space and she can have it and that's fine so now, a, a prior roommate of Emma's, she described Emma uh, talking about feeling drawn to Victoria and Emma having a belief that, you know, something important was going to happen there in Victoria. Did you ever hear Emma mention anything like that? Did she talk uh, to you about why she was in Victoria? I asked her a couple of times, but she mostly would answer like in a quite a cryptic and vague way, being like, oh, I feel like I'm meant to be here. And like uh, she had that about her very much is that she felt drawn to things like if she had an instinct to walk somewhere then she was like oh that's what I need to do I need to do like I need to go to this place and then she'd go there and like pick up a rock or something and then walk and be like that was like kind of the purpose in a in a way like she never said gave me a direct answer to why she was here but she just said that she felt like she needed to be here and what was living with her like? Could you like could you just describe kind of her her behavior and you know and how she was passing the time at at, at this point in her life? Um, well, at first she was working at a cafe downtown, and she had and she opened the cafe, so she worked very early in the morning at around like five a.m. or so. Then after a while, and I've heard things about this cafe as well that like the management isn't great and that it does have a very high turnover and she was let go and she was quite upset about it she uh, went into a bit of like not a, not an admitted way of depression but it seemed that way um but she was also quite a bit older than me and I figured that she was just going through some stuff and she liked to take very long baths. Um, we paid for a lot of heating, <laughs> a lot of hot water for those baths. And um, she didn't eat very much, but she would go for very long walks too. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as the, lo the long walks, uh, I I've heard about these quite a bit because it, it seems like um, from, a from a young age, you know, these these walks that she would go on were you know were, were a constant thing and it seemed like they were getting 
longer and and more frequent at, at the point that she was living with you was it like was it like every night or every day that these long walks would happen it was always during the day she did not like going out at night she also um admitted to me that she had um she did not have very good vision um she didn't want to get contacts or glasses and i have no idea if she ever had them in her past and so she said at nighttime it was very difficult to see things. So she, it would always take place during the day that she would do that. Uh, unless I was with her. Then if, like, if I was with her, then we'd go for a walk. But I didn't know for her to go out late by herself. Um, yeah, she described it to me, though, that she liked her world that way blurry she described it to me as um living life in a watercolor painting which i thought was a positive way of looking at it huh yeah, interesting way to think of it you mentioned her her unusual eating habits and i've heard about this as well from a, a, pr a prior roommate I described emma um very particular about what she would eat even avoiding like uh, things that grew on trees for as as an example of like an unusual eating habit Dur during the time that she was living with you what what was going on with with her diet um it was very unusual it was very limited she um didn't eat any fruit uh she believed that she was allergic to sugar nothing with sugar in it whatsoever except for mustard she would she would eat mustard but only one very specific brand um, which I don't remember the name of. Um, and she mostly ate popcorn. Lots of popcorn. Um, and I also figured that, like, since she told me that she was a trained chef, that she knew what she was doing, which seems silly. So, like, for like for a meal? she Yeah, for a meal, she would mo eat, like, a huge bowl of popcorn. No vegetables no fruit. She'd have this um, kind of soybean based thing as well. The um, It's called tempeh. Mm -hmm. She'd eat that. Uh, I'm just think I'm just thinking like if your, if your diet was that way, you would think you'd be really low on energy. Like, did she, like, do, do you think it affected her health or did you see any signs that this kind of diet affected her? Uh, yes, I did. She, like when she'd go on her walks she would like tell me about like how sore she was she'd take very long naps and long baths as well um she would sit in the sun for really really long amounts of time and for a while like i suspected that she also was like trying to absorb it in a way you know like those people that like in like that claim they don't eat or drink anything they just sit in the sun and like live that way I had heard that she'd been treated for for scurvy due to her her diet. Did, were you involved in that, or, or were you around when when that happened? I was not around. Um, she told me about it, um, and she wasn't diagnosed with it. It was more her own research that she did, and um, yeah, she said that she was looking up all these symptoms, and it lined up with scurvy more than anything else. And she thought it was hilarious in a way and i figured that was also like a coping method <laughs> of some sort and that would have happened um in december of 2011. Wow. she said it was in the winter time when she was at the shelter wow uh just speaking of the, of the shelter and were you ever involved with with the shelter like were you ever there with emma or, or did you have any connection? um i went there once it, and what was that like it was a nice building. Um, there was a big kitchen. Um, she was. I brought her some fish that I had caught because at that time, this is much later. Um, she was just eating fish, so I caught some fish, and gave her some fish. <laughs> so she was cooking that, and um, it was very brief. No place I would want to be. I knew her stay. <laughs> and you now thinking of a, a lot of Emma's behavior. Like to somebody on on the outside looking in, like it seems unusual and strange. And to me, like again, as someone on the outside looking in, I, I would question 
either if she had an issue with with mental health or involvement with with drugs or, or alcohol like did, did you know her to have any any connection with with drug or alcohol abuse not with drug abuse whatsoever mm-hmm. but definitely with alcohol abuse okay how did like could you describe like what what you saw or what you experienced with 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 alcohol abuse because i because i haven't heard of this before well when i was working full-time when after she had lost her job and usually when i'd come home she was drinking quite a bit of vodka olives are another thing she ate (laughs) um but usually with the vodka um but yeah she was drinking quite a bit of that every couple of days um there'd be another big bottle in the freezer um and when she was drinking she would it was it wasn't like it was like when she was like taking a bath or then or she would drink a lot and then like fall asleep um every now and then she would get very chatty but i just figured that she was going through something but just didn't really think to ask but it it wasn't like a like a drinking like a party kind of thing this was something she was doing kind of on her own yeah it was on her own it was she was drinking by herself and heavy amounts so so when you saw this going on i'm assuming you just assumed you know she was you know had her had everything together and just because when you're when i'm hearing it like it sounds like uh you know an unusual situation how did you view emma and, and her behavior um it's a good question <laughs> In a way, I was very intimidated by her. Like, she was just very free-spirited in a lot of ways. And I respected that. And I respected her, like, freedom to do what she likes. And that she is an adult and she probably knows best. And, like, she what did tell me about some of, like, her travels and some places that she had gone to and it just all sounded so magical in a way. And I had, and, and that's, those are things that I wanted to do, but it was also at times that she just seemed very not on edge, but just she was trying to comfort herself and she was looking for a safe place and that was it and needed her space and her privacy. That was just fine with me. If, that, if that makes sense. <laughs> it, it, how long was it in, in total that that you lived together for? Um, about three months. It, it, when the end came, like what, like what led to you separating or, or not living together anymore? How, how did that happen? Well, um, we were talking about traveling, and um, she was telling me about this experience that she had. And this particular story really sticks with me because of when I mentioned it to Shelly, she said that she'd never heard of anything of her doing anything like that. But she told me that she was living on a mustard farm and that it had beautiful fields and it had, um, and she was living in this house there and it was sunny and gorgeous and all these very picturesque details on it and I was like oh that's what I want to do like that's what I want to do I want to go traveling and I want to just like go down to California and then like in a very whimsical way just kind of was like yeah I want to go down to California and she's like yeah and just dance on a beach or something I was like yeah I just want to do that and then she was like we should we should do it and I said okay and so I started to get rid of my things and I took it very seriously and she did as well but started to fade away from it after some time and so that was the plan is that we were gonna go traveling together did you have a destination as to where you would go um arizona was the initial idea because of we were hoping to get a van and drive down the west coast um and then go over to Arizona and see the desert and maybe New Mexico and then just find our way back. Just go on an adventure. 
what happened next? I'm, I'm assuming this trip didn't materialize. Well, for her, it didn't. I started looking at vans and, like, got rid of a lot of my stuff. Um, I moved some of my furniture that I kept at my parents' place. Uh, I sold my truck. And I had a cute little truck that, yeah, got rid of. Yeah, I got, got out of the house. Stayed was staying with my parents. And I was going around different car lots looking for affordable vans and she would buy half and I'd we'd split the cost for it and she was staying up in Victoria and she said she was staying with a friend um, which I later found out was actually in a hotel that is now closed and was uh, had a big fire there um, it was a very seedy kind of hotel that was over on Queens and it, so for, so for a, as this trip was being planned she used were living separately Yes. And like I had a friend in Victoria who I'd come up and stay with and she would stay with whoever she was staying with. Yeah. So I was trying to get things together and plan this. And she increasingly, as I started to get more into it, she started to step away from it a whole lot more. And then she proposed like, oh, well, why don't we just hitchhike? Like, we don't need a van because I was just like, I can't find a van. Like, there's no good vans out there. And she's like, well, why don't we just hitchhike? We can hitchhike. Like, it'll be like, it'll be fine. Like, I've hitchhiked a lot. And I'm like, yeah, I've hitchhiked a lot, too. You know what? That probably could be fine. So I just got a backpack. And then like a lot of her things that she had, like as far as packing goes, like I went and got like a really nice women's like deuter backpack. Like, you know, those ones. And she like had a big canvas, like really heavy bag with like a lot of scarves on it. And I was like, well, she's she's doing her thing. Like, I guess if that's what she wants to bring, then that's what she'll bring. But I'm going to have a comfortable backpack. <laughs> um, like it just did. It just didn't seem very organized. And so a few days before we were supposed to leave, she backed out of it and I went by myself. So it, she backed out just like days before. How did she tell you? Do you remember? She just said that she needed to be here and that she came to Victoria and that she wasn't ready to leave it and that she needed to stay. And you accepted that and you just did the trip on your I own. Was, I was a little bit upset at first um, and a bit disappointed, but I also knew it was something that I needed to do with or without her. And so she stayed behind at Victoria. You left to go you know traveling while you were away were you still in touch like emailing or anything like that yeah we we were emailing and i did um i had a friend as well who i introduced her to before i left who she spent a lot of those months with mm -hmm. um who was living in the inner harbor on a sailboat and i would mail to him and then i'd send her letters too they were just like very whimsical here i am in san francisco now kind of things and then we were also emailing each other, but they were very cryptic emails that were very dreamy and kind of, yeah, that was like a lot of our friendship was, was like that. Mm -hmm. It was all like a watercolor painting. And, and the, the tone of the messages you were getting while you were away, did it seem like, you know, everything was just fine with her or was she, or, or was it too cryptic and vague to even really understand what was going on? There were bits and pieces that were pretty straightforward, but a lot of it was kind of like, oh, I, I will get a, I will hop on a large bird and fly down to see you, like kind of like a children's story in a way. Um, but there were a bit, there was uh, some of them. One of them was about how she was in the library and she had to go because she was frightened of someone there and she had to go because of the, her time was running out and that she was in Vancouver staying with a drag queen or something to that effect when you were down in the u.s you, you did come back to victoria for a period of time and, and i think when you came back from the u.s you had somebody else with you at this point is that right yes that's right uh, i met someone when i was traveling and brought him back to meet the fam jam <laughs> in addition to meeting the fam jam you, he met emma when, when was this that that you would have come back from the u.s um, it would have been August of of 2012. Yes. Okay. And when you had reconnected with Emma, what was what was going on then? Like, did you spend much time with her? And do you know what was what she was up to? I wasn't too sure what she was up to. 
I heard that she was living on a boat. Like, it was very briefly touched down on in the emails. And I wasn't sure, but she didn't make it clear if she was living on it or staying on it. And I just assumed it was our friend's boat. Um, and our friend was working in the Inner Harbor. And she was, and he had told me that she was only eating fish. I was surprised by this. And when I asked her about it, she was like, yeah, that's just what my body's asking for. It's like, that's all it needs. And that's, that's just it. That like, I don't need anything else, just fish. And I was like, well, if that's all your body needs, then I guess, I guess like, I can't like, you can't force feed someone other things. And she already had peculiar dietary uh, choices. So I just figured it was another one of those. And, um, yeah. And so she seemed, but she seemed very floaty. <laughs> like she didn't seem as, um, like on her tracks as she was because of like, she was always a very whimsical and always, but she had the, had this like really strong fierce side to her as well i felt like when i was seeing her more and when i was living with her she still had like a very like a very like she could put her shields up and and be a tough lady if she wanted to and um she seemed a lot more i don't want to say fragile but more fragile when i was asking her about things and in her summer it was all like it wasn't the same kind of excited way of describing something in the previous like poetic expression okay but so you, that makes sense. <laughs> you, you so you did notice some change uh, just in the, the short period you were away yes she seemed a lot more distant there we go to sum it all up okay. she seemed a lot more distant so you, you had a bit of time reconnecting in in victoria uh you had left victoria again um prior to to november Yes, um, I was. I was only. I was only in Canada for a couple of weeks before I went um, with the person that I met to uh, to Scotland. You were in Victoria a few days, reconnected with Emma, went to Scotland for a period of time. D- yeah. Did you? And then England and all over the place. Did you reconnect with it? Or were you back in Victoria? Or did you reconnect with her at all after that? I sent a few emails. I didn't get a whole lot of returns um i didn't really connect with her when i got back i only got back shortly before she went missing when was it that that you got back do you recall not exactly like mid-november okay about and um yeah when i got back uh, i saw her and that was that was about it. Yeah, so um, I flew back into Seattle from London, and uh, there was a, there was a storm, and we had to stop somewhere in the states and there was delays and had to stay in seattle for a little bit before i caught the clipper back over to victoria and i was very very jet lagged and very very tired and my mom came and picked me up in the inner harbor and i was very sad at the time as well i was very sad to be leaving uh england and then um, we were driving up blanchard and the women's shelter is on the corner of Blanchard and Burdett. And um, I saw her on the corner near the courthouse, across the, like near the women's shelter. And she looked like just really sad, like really, really sad. And, and she was look, staring at this murder of crows that was just in front of her. And she looked, it was raining and she was just wet and and my mom, she asked me, do you, oh, look, there's Emma. Like, oh, you must like, you you should, you should you must go see her. Like, do you want to stop so you can go and say hi? And from pure exhaustion, I said, no, I, I'll just see her another day. 
and that was the last time I saw her. Oh, and that that would have been just days prior to. Yeah. Yeah. And that must be something that you play through in your head constantly. I'm I'm thinking. Yeah, it's there a lot. I want to interrupt the conversation just briefly as at this point in our talk, Micah had become obviously affected by the emotional weight of that experience. After taking a few moments to pause and collect our thoughts, we continued our discussion now focusing on the period of time after Emma's disappearance. So I'll get back to Micah now. How, how did you find out that she actually went missing? I... Um... It took me a long time to get over my jet lag, and at the time I was I was pretty heartbroken as well. And um, my parents sat me down and told me. And I, I assume this was a like a huge surprise, a shock. Can you can you talk? Can you tell me about your reaction? It was actually really terrifying. It was really like it like there were so many things in my head that I didn't know how to really absorb I, I still don't know how to absorb it um but then i thought maybe it's only like a couple of days thing like because she maybe she just like went off somewhere like because she always talked about like running off to these places in very extravagant ways um and they were very dramatic and it was always an adventure the way that she would talk about it um and so i was like well maybe she just went camping for a little bit or maybe she just like and i went through all these possibilities in my head and then, yeah, I did not accept it for for quite some time. I still haven't, like, honestly. Mm-hmm. After her disappearance, were you involved with the search and, you know, all that that was going on with her mother and, and Victoria? Um, a little bit here and there, but not not as much as a lot of other people. I was going through a lot of personal things at the time as well that were really... Yeah, it was like a snowball. There was a, it was a huge, there was like an explosion um, of really unfortunate things just happening. And I got very overwhelmed and I, I went up and talked to Shelly a few times, but I wasn't very heavily involved with the search. I was very heartbroken at the time about a lot of different things. Do you recall your last communication with her? I don't remember exactly. No. Was there, I'm just wondering if there was ever like, like a real, like red flag or sign that she was in distress and it wasn't, you know, her, her normal behavior. There, like they increasingly, I do recall like getting an email from her, but I don't recall exactly what it said, That it seemed more tense. Like she just seemed stressed some people think that her behavior leading up to her disappearance would be consistent with someone who was, you know, being stalked or, or followed. Um, some people also may, thought it maybe was just a mental illness leading her to be paranoid. Do you know of any reason why she'd be fearful or? or- um, not someone in particular, but I, I would, I definitely suspected that she did have some trauma with with someone. But I never asked about it because it seemed like information she was protecting. Um, but yeah, I definitely, yeah, she did have that fear of of someone. She was one of those people that was like very, like so bright that a lot of people would kind of see it and like kind of go towards it, you know, like a moth to a light or something. She, and, I, and there were a couple times where I definitely did see her like, when we were like just out and about where she, I did see her like very much defend herself. But when I like just in a verbal kind of way, you know, if someone calls out or something. Um, yeah, she definitely had fear, but I also like now reflecting on it and like, maybe I like, maybe it could have been 
a state of psychosis, um, or it could have been some trauma that she had held on to. I honestly didn't really know enough about it, mm-hmm. and I wish I'd asked more. Mm-hmm. But I never wanted to pry. Yeah, looking back on on everything now, and you know all the the behavior that you you had seen with Emma. Do you have any doubt that she was suffering from a mental illness? No. It does seem like there was something something up. I'm not a psychologist, so I can't like diagnose exactly what I saw, but there's probably like a long list of things that could be overdiagnosed to people just by simple little tweaks that they have. So I don't want to like run to anything being like it could have been this or this or this, but there there was a state of um like she seemed like she was in a dream state a lot of the time for the entire time that i knew her it was like a it was a little bit of a different reality and you were there during kind of the the months leading up to her disappearance where it seemed like she drifted from a lot of the the people that that she was really close with you know these kind of mysterious months where her behavior really seemed to cross the line into possibly into a crisis type situation. Can you share your thoughts on what you think may have happened or, or what may have become of Emma? I have a lot of thoughts about about this. Like it, it's it's constant. It you know it, it's always changing. It's always moving as to what a possibility could be. Um, one of them is that she somehow gotten over the border into the States and could be somewhere down there. Another one is that maybe she went out to the East Coast where, it, I don't know, it, like she could be in a small town like way up north or or she could starved out in like going out into some sort of mountain range. Like if someone picked her up downtown, I... I don't think that it it's um, impossible that she could have gotten to someone's car if someone was like, hey, like, do you need to ride somewhere? And she'd be like, oh, yes, um, I'm actually going like out to uh, Souk. And then they'd be like, oh, well, I'm going that way, too, kind of thing. And having her like jump out of the car at some point or getting out, asking to be to be let go, like in the middle of nowhere and going into the forest, like without shoes Um, or just going for a swim in the ocean. Like there is so many possibilities. I have no idea. And given something, you know, so traumatic uh, in your happening in your life with, you know, a, a, someone this close to you disappearing, how often is, is Emma in, in your mind and how, how often are you, are you thinking about this? Quite, quite often, but I try not to, which I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I feel I've never felt so helpless in, about anything in all of my life. I don't even know how to contribute and I don't know how to start. So it, it it's not a great, it's, it's not, it's like, it's a terrible thing. It's not, it's just, it's not a great thing at all. It's, I don't know. I don't even know how to answer that. And now for, for anyone who doesn't know Emma, if you were just to describe the feeling you had being with her again she you described her as as whimsical and you know magical and creative and talking like it's a children's novel it must have just been incredible to to spend time with her can you just d- talk a little bit about how you felt with emma um, i felt it was all just so playful. There, it was. There was always something really, like everything to her in a way. Like whenever she was around, everything around her just seemed like magical in its own way. She, like the one of the first times that we really hung out, we didn't even say anything, and we just started laughing. And then it just like, uh, it was. I don't know. These are the things I I don't think, I try not to think about. So I'm just, I'm sorry, Jordan. I'm sorry. I, I just wish I, 
I don't know. I, I just, I wish there was so much more I could do. <laughs> If you're still with me, I want to thank you for joining Micah and I in this conversation. To me, speaking of course as a layman, Micah's comments continue to highlight what appears to be Emma spinning out of control. In our next episode, we'll continue following this narrative with another of Emma's close friends. When we return next, in part 7, we're going to hear from a young man who became close with Emma after she lives with Micah and just prior to her disappearance a time when she was living in a state of homelessness in and around the Victoria waterfront. I can really recall the only time I thought she was exhibiting some signs of instability was two weeks before the incident with uh, the neighbor. She was just saying she was having a really hard time now that it was like raining. When the summer ended, I think she was having a really hard time adjusting to the fact that it was going to be a different kind of lifestyle and I think anything but what she was doing in the summer that kind of like euphoria that like the simplicity of it all and the fact that she could be outside for 12 hours a day when that started to change I she just kind of seemed overwhelmed with life down at the wharf when it wasn't beautifully sunny and with that we'll conclude this episode of the nighttime series Emma Filipoff is missing But before we wrap things up, I have some thanks. First and foremost, I'd like to thank Micah for so generously sharing such intimate memories. Hearing you speak is not only heartbreaking, but it really helps understand Emma's state of mind leading up to her disappearance. Next, a big thank you to Vox Somnia and Paragon Cause for providing the musical and ambient themes for this series. And lastly, the biggest thanks of all goes to everyone listening without you, the sun would have rose on nighttime years ago. For anyone out there who wants more nighttime, please consider supporting my Patreon campaign. For a dollar a month, you can access the ad-free premium feed which provides early releases of the episodes. And then, for only a couple dollars more, you can access the Nightcap After Show in which I and a guest climb further down the rabbit holes than what you'll hear in the main episodes. For this episode's nightcap, I'm going to release a discussion I had with Aaron of the Generation Y podcast that was recorded shortly after he covered Emma's disappearance on his show. Here's a short sample. I think there's something about Emma that's the key here because it started early on. But I also think it's hopeful because if she's heading in a direction where she's becoming more and more secretive, more and more withdrawn, that makes it a lot more likely in my mind that she could have ended up living among the homeless Hmm. and just living in an area where there aren't people looking for her. If you want to hear this and my other supporter exclusive episodes, you can access the premium feed by visiting patreon.com slash nighttime podcast. And with that said, I want to thank the new members to the group, Matthew D, Mike C, Casey and Mitchell. Thank you for your generous support. And for anyone else who'd like to support the show but can't help financially, you can give me a big hand by telling your friends about me and leaving a positive review on Apple Podcasts or the equivalent. If any of you listening want to stay up to date with my activities on and off the show, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I use the handle at NighttimePod. If any of you have any story ideas or want to give feedback on the show, I'd love to hear from you at NighttimePodcast at gmail.com. Now until next time, take care of each other, hug your loved ones tight, and contact me on social media and give me your theory on Emma Filipoff's disappearance. The Nighttime Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Jordan Bonaparte. Copyright Jordan Bonaparte. Somebody somewhere knows something. She didn't just disappear. She couldn't just vanish. Somebody has to know something, Jordan. Somebody has to know something.